Do you ever feel like you've watched tons of guides, played a lot of games, and learned a lot, but you're just not getting better? Unfortunately, this is a very common problem, where League just doesn't seem to be easy to pick up for a lot of people. This is due to the fact that learning and implementation of what you've learned are completely different things, and it's no secret that League is insanely hard. For example, I've been playing music my entire life, and play professionally. I would like to think I have a pretty solid understanding of my instruments and music theory. I know what notes I'm supposed to play, and when to play them. But it's still going to take me a few hundred hours if I want to learn Polyphia's playing god. I just don't have the muscle memory. In other words, I know what to do, but there's a disconnect between knowing and actually doing. So how do we fix this? Well, there's a few ways, but by far the most efficient is to find patterns from things you do already know and understand, and transfer it to what you're trying to learn. Now, when I'm trying to learn other games, I often borrow from what I do know, which is League of Legends. But it wasn't always like that. Everyone watching this video has a literal lifetime of experience to draw upon, and has learned to do challenging things in the past. Even if you think that's not true, go back and think about how even learning a simple task like how to tie your shoes was probably once a monumental ordeal. And now, you can do it without thinking, relying on your muscle memory alone. If this is your first MOBA, or even your first competitive game, you may feel like you're at a huge disadvantage. But today, we're going to give you ideas that you can use to translate to League of Legends to make this insanely hard game just click. And by the way, if you really want to make improving at League easy, then you'll want to check out our website, skillcap.com. Take our brand new Master in Minutes course on CSing. Each video in this course teaches you one concept in less time than it takes to start a game of League of Legends. So while you wait for your next game, you can learn breakpoint patterns, last hitting under tower, optimal settings, the list goes on all in just a few minutes to maximize your improvement rate. Once you're last sitting like a pro, hop into our Master in Minutes course on Wave Control, Trading, or Warding. The list keeps growing as we add brand new courses each week. These courses have been getting 5-star ratings from all of our users, raving at how helpful they are. Seems too good to be true? Well, don't worry because we're backed by a rank up guarantee. If you don't significantly improve while actively using Skillcapped, then you get your money back, no questions asked. We're the only service that can offer this because you'll actually see results. So, what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below and get the rank you've always wanted. Alright, now let's get into today's guide. To start, let's talk about a real world game that you might think has zero possible relationships to League. Billiards, better known as Pool. When 99% of you and I play Pool, we're most likely concerned with just hitting a ball into the pocket. But let's compare that to how a super high level pro thinks about the game. Positional play is planning where your cue ball will end up after executing a shot. The way I play position is I always plan three shots ahead. He's just barely explaining the basics of how to think about positioning the cue ball. But if you watch him plan out the entire table at once, it's pretty miraculous. You may be wondering how this applies at all to League, but this is really exactly the same thing that we have to do when it comes to planning out team fights and our ganks. When coaching, I'll often notice patterns like this, where my student fails to identify which target to go on. This should be a really obvious example, but if we kill Sona here first, we're going to be in a perfect spot to prevent Kiana's escape, regardless of what happens to our teammates. He may get the kill on Kiana here, but Sona unfortunately ends up living due to this miscalculation. Positional play in League ranges from simple examples like this one to incredibly complicated positioning decisions in large-scale teamfights. But I think the important thing to think about is the pre-planning of where you're going to end up after finishing killing a target. Visualizing setting up a pool ball could be the thing that some of you need to make that happen. This level of foresight really isn't talked about very often for League, and in a game like pool it's something that is front and center at what they have to think about every time they shoot the ball. For another game like Rocket League, it might be more obvious that positional play is extremely valuable, but just because it's not obvious for us, it doesn't mean it isn't important in League. Obviously, we're just scratching the surface here, but hopefully you have a better idea of what kinds of parallels we're going to draw, so let's keep going. When it comes to card games, there is one concept in particular that feels very foreign to League players at the start, but is completely obvious in these kinds of games. The use of health as a resource. In Yu-Gi-Oh, for example, some of the best cards in the game might make you pay upwards of 30% of your health total. That may sound absolutely ridiculous coming from a league perspective, but from a gameplay perspective, you have to think about what they're potentially doing with that health cost. Something like Solemn Strike costs 1500 life points, which out of your 8000 total is not an insignificant cost. 
However, you could potentially be negating the summoning of a massive card for your opponent. They might have invested three to four cards to pull off some sort of combo, and by using this at the right time, for the price of one card and some health, you're completely shutting that combo down. The idea is that in the long run, the negation of a combo like that saves you more than the health you actually use to pay for it. This is prevalent in something like Slay the Spire as well. The Ironclad character has several cards that cause self-damage at the trade-off of usually having a stronger effect. Hemokinesis costs health to play every time, but deals a massive amount of damage. In comparison, another card that costs the same amount of energy to play deals 5 less damage total. And that could be the difference between killing a target on a turn before you take a huge hit or not, saving you health in the long run. This idea translates to League pretty much one to one. You might be able to get free damage occasionally, but for the most part, if you want to hit really hard, you're going to have to lose some health of your own. Some players can be pretty scared of this, but knowing the right time to expend your health to gain an advantage is critical. Engaging onto an opponent in a wave like this may seem really bad, until you realize that it was to set up lethal on your opponent just moments later when you hit level 3. For another useful example, when you know you want to recall anyways, it doesn't really matter if your health is literally 1% or full. As long as you aren't dead, the end result is the same. So we can use the rest of our health to trade for our opponent's mana and HP, since we know we don't actually need ours anymore. And this can remove a resource from our opponent who actually wants and needs theirs. Zac, Cassante, and Mundo are all champions that do actually have health costs on abilities, and of course you do use their spells. But let's imagine that Zed had the option to create another ult shadow by paying half of his health as a cost. You'd probably want to use that pretty often, since killing your target is often all you care about. Basically, what I'm getting at is that losing health does not equal bad. And frankly, the same goes for dying. Of course, there are bad deaths, but going in, blowing a majority of the enemy's cooldowns, and creating a winning opportunity for your team by zoning champions is a good thing, even if the result may be your death. So we've addressed one physical sport, as well as some digital and physical games. Now, let's talk about something completely unrelated to both of these things to show you how you really can draw parallels from anything. The Art of War was written by Sun Tzu in the 5th century BC, and it's essentially a book on the art of warfare and military tactics. I'm paraphrasing, but there is essentially a quote in it that states, if two armies are of equal strength, the army that must approach will lose. If we look at this in a literal sense in a tactical game, we will see how this is universally true. In a tactical shooter like Valorant, Overwatch, or CSGO, you can plant a bomb or maybe play around specific objectives, which, once done, puts your opponents on a literal timer to lose the game. If they don't come, you are guaranteed to win. This puts your opponents in an awkward spot where their movement is limited. Once you know where they need to go, you can start pre-aiming around corners, setting traps, and waiting. In general, this telegraphing of movement is very hard to deal with and is compounded upon by other mechanics in the game. In these shooters, there are also movement penalties applied to your aim. When running, your aim is just straight up worse than if you're standing still. While we might not have these specific movement penalties in League, we do have ways to incentivize our opponents to come to us and also ways of punishing them for doing so. The most obvious advantage that you have when opponents are approaching is that you are likely to have better vision than them. After all, in order to place wards, you need to actually, well, be in the area. If you're running into an area where your opponents have already been, you will not only be on their vision, but also not have any pre-existing vision of your own. Combining this with objectives like Dragon and Baron can force your opponents to need to come to an area that they just don't have any vision in. If they come, they're disadvantaged in the fight due to lack of vision. And if they don't, then they risk giving up a large buff that will skew the game heavily in one team's favor. This is the simplest example, but it also goes for a lot of one-on-one -on -one matchup dynamics as well. Let's imagine Riven versus Graves. In this lane, Graves can harass Riven with ranged attacks while Riven cannot do the same. In order to actually trade, Riven has to commit several movement spells to go in and actually create pressure. All of this, and Graves can just dash away with his own, which would return us to the exact same dynamic of Graves having the ability to harass Riven while she cannot return damage. This makes the matchup incredibly Graves favored, as long as he maintains his dynamic of forcing Riven to approach. If we consider a situation where Graves is just dashing into Riven, essentially becoming the person who approaches, it's not hard to imagine how Riven has a much easier time handling that situation. 
It's rather amusing to me that a book written multiple centuries ago can have such relevance to a game made less than 20 years ago. But again, you can find parallels everywhere you look. Chess especially is a game that I love to draw comparisons to, and have done so before in the past, especially concerning the ideas of tempo as well as controlling the center of the board. But today, let's go for a more abstract angle concerning mentality. Let me introduce you to Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky, one of my personal favorite chess content creators and teachers. In this video, he is playing against lower rated players to show how to climb to Grandmaster, not too dissimilar to smurfing in League. Listen to what he has to say about going for cheese against lower rated opponents. Don't let your opponent's rating dictate what you do. Like that's a very sad way to play. You should just play the same way against anybody, which is why we're building good habits in the speeder and I'm doing maybe overkill against lower rateds in my technique and stuff and my explanations. But if you build those good foundations, you'll have the foundation to beat higher rateds later on in your chess career. This is a mentality that I 100% subscribe to. Even in low elo for league, if you just have good fundamentals and play correctly, disregarding that your opponents might play extremely stupidly, you will still win. You don't need to try and cheese or do unorthodox strategies to adjust your level of play to meet your opponent. Good ideas and plays are strong because they're fundamentally sound. They work regardless of the elo, and understanding that fact is paramount to becoming a better league player. Oftentimes, we should not look at results of what actually happened in our games, but instead consider the possibility of what if our opponent did the absolute best play here? Does my idea still work? This is incredibly common in chess for players to go study potential lines and other moves that their opponents could have made. But in League, we tend to see primarily results-based analysis. This is just one of the many ideas that makes a chess player successful, but also what makes a good League player formidable as well. We can further analyze other sports like soccer or football for the non-Americans to see other aspects of mentality and strategy that translates well for us too. For example, let's look at how many players are in this frame for the goal when it gets scored. There are only 7 players on the United States team here, and if you're familiar with soccer, you'll know that there are 11 players total on each team at a given time. Of course, the goalie is, well, in the goal, but there are 3 more players that are unaccounted for here. They might not be directly contributing to this goal, but them not being here is critical for this scoring opportunity to happen. Something that soccer teams do well is accounting for the worst possible outcome. Obviously, they want to approach and score at the opponent's goal, but you can't just keep going forward all the time. It's imperative that players stay behind to allow for retreating passes to reposition the ball. Additionally, these players could compete for balls that get intercepted or stolen from players in the more forward positions. In League, there are several applications of this, but one of the most common happens in team fighting. If you identify that your ADC or mid is the most important person on your team, you don't always have to dive forward in a team fight, and can instead sit back and just play to peel and protect your carry. You may not initially be doing a ton in the fight, but the sheer fact that you exist is often enough to dissuade opponents from diving, allowing your carry to do damage. Fully committing every member of a team to trying to score a goal leads to tons of breakaways where someone can make it all the way down the field past the defenders. And you'll see this a lot in other sports like basketball, where with less players, you can't really afford to have one person sitting back at all times. This on top of rules like offsides in soccer means that you're scoring way less goals on average than a lot of other sports, for better or for worse. In racing games, there is usually only one goal. Get to the end as fast as possible. Players of these games spend hours and hours on optimization of tiny movements, running the same track over and over again to shave portions of seconds off. But is this really something that League players do? I doubt even most jungle mains have sat in practice tool optimizing their jungle clears to be pixel perfect, unless your name is Phalaris. Even if you aren't interested in jungle clearing, I see plat and diamond players walk over options that would make their movement much faster. Even taking these two blast cones would save a ton of time and make the ensuing play guaranteed. This isn't hard to find when looking at games, but it does really make you think. Racing games place so much emphasis on these optimizations, but why don't we? Maybe it's a culture surrounding the game, or just something that gets shoved to the back of our brains when playing, but it does make a huge difference, and challenger players are definitely extremely fast with regards to clears and moving around the map. I had to throw in my personal favorite game of all time to this mix, but it's also just a great example as well. In Super Smash Bros. Melee, as well as other fighting games, the concept of baiting over extensions and whiff punishing is extremely prevalent. A lot of combo openings are created by players first baiting their opponents to respond. Here, Mango dashes in to bait the getup attack, and then dashes back to dodge. 
finally, he comes back to punish it. There are a ton of techniques in melee in particular that are centered around this. Wave dashing back, shielding, crouch canceling, the list goes on and on, but it's an integral part to what fighting game players call neutral. In fact, McBay's actually just made a video on this exact topic, which you can find on our website. He compared Street Fighter to League of Legends, and the tactics that you should use in lane to bait out spells from your opponents really transfer here. I thought it was really cool and very informative, so if you want to delve more into that topic, go ahead and watch that video. Of course, I could go on for hours and hours about this, drawing more topics, more sports, more games. Every topic here doesn't just have one parallel to draw, but many, and you can even connect two things from this list together without using League of Legends at all. Personally, I just find it fascinating that all of these games, systems, and tactics can apply for so many different things, but it definitely makes it a lot easier when I'm picking up a new game to compare things to something I already know. You'll see tons of people who are good at one game be good at others too, like this player who hit the highest rank in TFT, League of Legends, Legend of Runeterra, and Valorant. In part, this is just due to the fact that lessons learned in one area will apply to the others. There may be unique struggles and difficulties with learning any specific game, but at the end of the day, none of us are truly starting from scratch. It's just a matter of pulling on past experiences to lead the way. And if you truly want to fast track your improvement, then head on over to our website, skillcap.com. Take our brand new Master in Minutes course on CSing. Each video in the course teaches you one concept in less time than it takes to start a game of League of Legends. So while you wait for your next game, you can learn breakpoint patterns, last hitting under tower, optimal settings, the list goes on, all in just a few minutes to maximize your improvement rate. Once you're last hitting like a pro, hop into our Master in Minutes course on wave control, trading, or warding. The list keeps growing as we add new courses each week. These courses have been getting five-star ratings from all of our users raving at how helpful they are. Seems too good to be true? Well, don't worry because we're backed by a rank up guarantee. If you don't significantly improve while actively using skill caps, then you get your money back, no questions asked. We're the only service that can offer this because you'll actually see results. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below and get the rank you've always wanted. All right, thanks so much for watching and we'll catch you in the next one.